Hungry takes us all the way to Season 7, and is by Vince Gilligan of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul fame. This starts in a typical place, but takes an unusual turn. I mean, for this show, even factoring in the literal freak show that we just had. An asshole, and I mean a real asshole, this is the kind of guy who licenses being an asshole out to other assholes in a massive asshole pyramid scheme with him as the frickin' asshole pharaoh at the top. He wants dinner and won't take We Just Closed for an answer. Yelling, arguing, blaring music, honking his horn, he's gonna get killed by the monster and it's hard not to see this as fully justified. The loss of any human life diminishes us, but when it comes to this guy, We'd need, like, NASA instruments to be able to detect it. If you want the detail, he gets pulled into the window and his car rolls off into a tree. That's all we see. Though the sounds coming from the inside says that food has just gone through the window the wrong way this time. After the titles, we see the same restaurant as an employee shows up to make the world a better place one fast food burger at a time. But doing the good lord's work is going to have to wait because Mulder and Scully have arrived because the car and body were found, and at the scene, they found an employee promotion button. Everybody has theirs, including our model employee, except for the guy in the back who's named Durwood. They only needed the things for Friday, he said, so he figures he must have left his at home. So everyone's giving him the you-just-took-a-guy's-brain look, while our model employee spies on Mulder and Scully as they note how pristine this restaurant is compared to all the other franchises they visited that day. Mulder wonders if this was where the crime happened. His brain was eaten right out of his skull, and then the killer cleaned up to dispose of any evidence. Our model employee listens to all of this, and with good reason, because he is the monster. But damn it, monsters need love too. Just ask Grover. But our monster, Rob Roberts, gets a visit from Mulder, who comments on the cleanliness of this apartment as well which is admittedly suspicious. I mean, it'd probably be less conspicuous if he took the bloody shirt out of the trash bag and just left it on the floor. Mulder also wants to know about Rob staying late on Friday. He volunteered to throw out the spoiled burgers. Only the meat isn't in the dumpster, though. Ew. Speaking of garbage, after Mulder leaves, Rob tosses away the trash bag with the bloody shirt, only to be spotted by Mulder sucking the blood off his fingers. Rob panics before he realizes that it's actually somebody else. Wow, I guess Dr. Blockhead was right. In the future, everyone really is going to look like Mulder. To round out his day, Rob gets a call from a shrink working for the company about a mandatory evaluation in the wake of the recent unpleasantness. So that's one more damn thing to do. But right now, his biggest concern is his hunger. His need to stalk the streets like the vile monster that he is, preying upon the innocent to devour their brains with no concern for the terror that he leaves in his wake. The amoral... Self-discipline. That's the name of this game. That's the one thing that separates us from the animals. Provided you have it. But where do you get it? You can't go down to the local convenience store and buy self-discipline. But actually, poor Rob is trying to resist the urge to be the monster that he is, looking for any strategy to help him resist his cravings and stop himself from murdering people. But he can't hold it back any longer, and so goes out and kills the Mulder clone for his tasty brain. A real pity that he gave in like that. It's going to go straight to his hips. The next morning, Rob is awakened by Durwood, who let himself in. Durwood's an ex-con, who had kept his secret until the murder, but he knows that Rob is the one who committed it. He found Rob's diet pills there with blood on the bottle. So, since it's Rob's fault that Durwood got fired, on account of them finding out about his past, Durwood figures that he'll blackmail him. But that's interrupted by the landlady, who's concerned about the guy who was out front that Rob ate. That he was there, not that Rob ate him. I don't think this conversation volume level would be at this range if he'd done that. Having dealt with that, Mulder swings by asking about Durwood, who's the prime suspect. Except in Mulder's view. Which is right, but let's not get carried away here. Remember, in our last review, Mulder was convinced that a hundred-year-old dead mermaid might be the culprit, but was skeptical of the idea of a conjoined twin being responsible. No, no, I, I should say that's the opinion of the Costa Mesa police and my partner. So he's, he's not your guy? No. No, I think we're looking for somebody who has a compulsion to kill. Wow, you got stuck with a nasty form of OCD, didn't you? I'm glad I'm more normal. 
<sighs> now to go wash my hands ten times and I can finally enjoy my Halloween candy. Anyway, now that that awkward discussion is done, Rob can meet with the shrink to talk about what happened. Although I don't know how doctor-patient confidentiality works with I ate a customer's brain. I mean, at the very least, corporate isn't going to be happy. Their session is interrupted by a call from Mulder, so Rob takes the opportunity to slip out. But at work, all he can see when he cooks are human brains. The distraction is something even worse. Durwood showing up for his last paycheck and to remind Rob of the blackmail. Uh, since this is farewell, when nobody was looking, I used to dip my boys in the coleslaw. Ugh, oh, I'm glad I stuck with the french fries. Realizing Durwood isn't the kind of guy who blackmail you once and then stop, Rob tries to find the pills, but Durwood finds him. So Rob removes his disguises, the ones that he uses to blend in with society, and... Another tragic slaying, I, I suppose. Really, Rob is two for three on killing people who probably had it coming. And don't forget that coleslaw thing. I mean, that's not only unhygienic, but that, that that's violating the sanctity of the fast food restaurant. That's blasphemy. Still, Rob does feel kind of bad about his, you know, his killing spree and goes back to see the psychiatrist who had been sympathetic, saying that even those who seem like monsters likely want to be better people. He says he needs help, but he can't exactly get into the I'm a freak who eats human brains thing, so he couches it in terms of irresistible urges to eat, and he feels it makes him a terrible person. So she sends him to an eating disorder support group, not realizing that she just sent a man with cannibalistic compulsions into a room full of fat people. That doesn't sound like it's going to end well. And more good news. Mulder and Scully have come to pay a visit, asking about Durwood and revealing to Rob Mulder's theory that genetic freak is responsible, as there's a fragment of shark tooth in the victim's skull. At the prompting of his landlady, at the meeting, Rob stands up and tries to explain how, in the last month, his cravings have become overpowering. By now you've probably discovered the hook of the episode, that this is a Monster of the Week episode from the point of view of the monster. But unlike someone like Toombs, who seemed to enjoy being what he was, Rob hates it, doesn't want to be what he is. Unlike those who might rationalize giving in to their instincts, Rob is fighting a heroic battle to resist them, and must do so in secret because of both his nature and his compulsion. But the thing about the battle is that sometimes you're going to lose, like after the meeting, where he goes in and attacks Sylvia, despite how nice she'd always been to him. While I'm sure he feels bad about it, the practical matter is that he's got to not look like the guilty party. So he busts in using Durwood's bat and smashes up his own apartment. When Mulder and Scully came by, he blames the whole incident at the restaurant on Durwood, saying that the guy stayed and told Rob to go home. But when Rob returned to make sure that he had the dumpster key, he caught Rob... He caught Durwood cleaning up all the blood. Sorry. What, what do you expect from me? I got a case of a guy named Rob Roberts who was just robbed. I can't help but say Rob right now. Anyway, the guy's story's got a few holes in it, but Mulder's more interested in the person who looked just like him. That is, Mulder. Turns out that that guy out in the car was a private eye. Things are spiraling out of control here. It's getting so a monster can't catch a break around here. So Rob is packing up to leave, but his psychiatrist swings by, concerned about him and his increasingly odd and erratic behavior, and his stammering bad lies. She pushes him, and we start to see that point arriving that I mentioned, where he's starting to rationalize away his killing, that it's a biological imperative and it's not his fault. She sees through him, sees that he was the murderer all along, and asks him to turn himself in. So he decides to lay the ugly truth out for her and removes all his prosthetics to reveal the real him. He doesn't get the response he expects. Now, do you believe in monsters? But the moment's lost when Mulder and Scully burst in. They found the body on the way to the landfill, and despite her pleading, he tries to attack them. Yeah. 
can't be something I'm not. Hungry gets a stamp of recommended, a fresh take on the monster of the week that works hard to develop empathy while at the same time not blanching at the horror of what Rob is turning into. Hungry provides, in a way, a bit of foreshadowing of Breaking Bad, also the tale of a person with good intentions and something beyond his control, creating a web of more and more elaborate lies that eventually leads him to rationalize and embrace his dark side, only to lead to a tragic end. The casting choice here was perfect. Rob feels like an everyday guy who's just trying to get from day to day, only to have this compulsion thrown upon him and being helpless. The technique combines well with the choice of monster, as both are, in and of themselves, high concept tales. X-Files from the monster's point of view, and monster that punches a hole in your skull and eats your brain. But rather than devolve into the predictable, hungry seeks to find the human soul at the center of the tale and amplify that. It's no coincidence that half of his victims are such scum. It shows by its contrast the unfairness of it all. People with no excuse to be what they are, while Rob struggles feebly to resist being what biology has made him to be.